first off, awesome to have you guys. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Me and too. I think Rhett knows I'm kind of a super fan, man. I love what you guys do, and I love the backstory and where you came from. I think it's just, it's like cool and ethical and honorable and, right, you did it the right way. I think it's all really cool. So I would love it if you guys would kick off just a couple of few minutes, man. Tell everybody who you are, a little bit of the backstory, and kind of how everything has evolved to where you are. Sure. Nate, why don't you do a brief intro and then I'll do a a brief intro and a little bit of our Genesis story. Uh, That sounds awesome. So Nate Bray, the Chief Innovation Officer at Loan Pro, spent about 17, 18 years in financial services. Uh, The majority of that time has always been on launching net new go-to-market strategies or building something that's never been done. That was in the early days back at Wells Fargo when Apple Pay was being created I got to be a part of some of those early projects all the way through like Amazon One when you were paying with your palm um, and trying to figure out Tesla pay, how to pay with your car uh, kind of stuff. And so then I left I left and left uh, left Wells Fargo and joined MX Technologies, which was the open banking platform, worked on some really cool next best action stuff with Google. Um, And then Rhett was my neighbor and he he was like, Hey, I've got this really cool idea that I'm going to revolutionize the credit card. And so that's how I got to uh, loan pro as we started talking about that and what that could look like and, and what, what a like new version of a revolving credit could look like uh, given that they were the core. So that's how I landed at loan pro. Yeah. We're, we're happy to have you here with this, Nate. So uh, Rhett Roberts, co-founder here at loan pro. I've been doing this journey for approaching 20 years now. And a little bit of our uh, Genesis story. I actually founded the business with my two brothers. And Tanner, you met met, uh, So you met Lloyd uh, at an event, Tanner, before. So Lloyd and Ben. um, And, you know, I I did school. I was going to go. I studied investment finance. I was going to go back on Wall Street. Got married about that time and was kicking around. You know, what do I really want to do? And I'd always been bit by the entrepreneur bug. I didn't have two nickels to run together. And so we were like, well don't have anything to lose. Let's go give this thing a whirl. Let's go try a few things. Right. So I uh, joined my two brothers. We started a car dealership and that uh, we had no idea what we were doing. So bought and sold cars for a few years. And we just kept asking questions of like, Hey, why does it work like this? And we constantly got the answer of like, I don't know, that's how grandpa did it. And so, you know, they just keep it that way. And we're like, all right, cool, whatever. Just kind of write it down and do the next one and the next one. And um, it was just like, an interesting industry. And as we learned a lot about it, this was quite some time ago, 15 plus years ago, there was a a pretty significant separation in prime versus subprime for financing. When people would come in to buy a car, it was either you go get a loan at a credit union for, I don't know, super low interest rate, two, three, 4%, or you're subprime and get a loan at 30%. And there's like no land in the middle. And we're like, who makes these rules? This is like an illogical thing. There's gotta be a spectrum, like a gradient in between. And so we started what was less common then of called a related finance company. And that's uh, much more common now today. And that just scaled and grew. And we truly fell in love with lending. All things about loans, they muted the volatility that happened in the retail business, right? Retail business is rough. It rains the last two days of the month. You're like, ah, now I got to start all over again. And you know, all of your costs are fixed. It was just frustrating, right? So to adding high levels of predictability and, and the, the benefits of a financial product was great. Scaled the lending business. We ran into a new problem that uh, we'd have customers call in and they would do what sounded like normal stuff, right? They would say, you know, this life experience happened. We had weird stuff. Customers call and be like, I can't make a payment because I spent the money at the county fair. They're like, whoa, okay. Well, did you spend all your money at the county fair? Yeah. So we had like all kinds of weird collection things. We repoed cars. We uh, learned all of the process of like sitting in the chair. And if, you know, if you filled that phone call and you hear the scenarios and you're like, ah, that's, that's a rough situation. Or, and we just started thinking about how could we make our portfolio more performant and help our customers. And it always just sort of rubbed us wrong that the industry did weird things. They had these magic chalk lines of 30, 60, 90 days past due. And if somebody's like 88 days past due, and then they flip over to 92 days past due, all of a sudden, like if they call in 88 days, you're like, no, make your payment. I can't do anything for you. If you engage with them at 92 days, 
all of a sudden all kinds of unlocks happen. You're like, well, what actually happened in those couple of days? So we just started thinking about it a little bit more common sense, like we were asking the questions back in the car lot days and the software we were using at the time to service and manage these loans let's say it left a lot to be desired, right? You needed right. like six or seven different pieces of software. They all are like single purpose and only do one thing. You had to build an orchestration layer to stitch them all together. They didn't all even do their math the same way. Some were not even compliant. And so we just said, whatever, let's just go ahead and build it. It can't be that hard. Turns out it's kind of hard. And <laughs> <laughs> I've done this. This is hard. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, that's been the journey. So, what was just an internal product to our own lending company, others reached out to us and said, Hey, can I use that? Like, no, go use your own, go build your own. Good luck. You know, it's an endless pit of money and you got to figure a ton of stuff out. And they kept coming back saying, No, I don't want to. Can I use yours? And at some point, I met with my two brothers and we're like, You know what? All these people are offering to give us money let's take it and see what happens. And that's when we kicked off what was basically monetizing what was an internal software product to our own lending company has turned into what the business is. So we sold the lending, the, the car dealerships, we sold the lending business. We had a couple other things. We had a, a windshield repair company that we invented a bridge that a suction cups to a windshield and does an injection to of resin into the layers of a windshield to fix a, a rock chip and then built software to submit claims to insurance companies. Like, so we did a whole bunch of these weird things and then what really did well is the software that we built to manage the portfolios. Turns out everyone who gives a loan, honestly, of any flavor. So we have student loans on the platform. We have Merchant Cash Advance, the whole spectrum of like consumer to B2B or corporate. And as you know, the regulatory environment's wildly different. And we have customers who do like, you know, federal charter, state charters, state licenses, all the different alphabet of regulatory things to be compliant with. And we built a platform that's, uh, we think, pretty awesome for that to support everything of loans. We think so too. An American story. I love it. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to add two funny parts to this that he left out. I love so it. Gone, are the, gone are the days of repoing horses and taking <laughs> payments in crab legs these are true <laughs> stories by the way and the first car he sold for his car lot his own car yeah that's right i didn't even have a car to drive home and it's like okay well i'm like honey i sold a car today it was your car yeah. <laughs> and we don't own a car now he's like yeah i think so yeah that's, that's a awesome. good thing True. i love it man so so tell yeah. me man so look you guys i mean you're involved in a lot of stuff right I, I love how you break it down, right? A lot like us of just, hey, man, we tried to figure some stuff out. But I mean, you guys have gotten to a really big place, right? You work with just about everybody doing, I mean, God knows the volume. And I mean, you guys are involved in everything. Definitely sort of the the lending as a service space is pretty much like y'all are like the godfathers. I mean, really, like you, a lot of that stuff comes from you guys. Something so, cool here, guys. Good. There's a, there's a lot of people that I, I guess I would say, you know, fringe fans. All that stuff. I mean, like you mentioned, M X while ago, I'm Tito Ladesi, Ryan back over there. There's a lot of people at your outfit that I've known for a long time in different parts of their careers. And uh, it, to, to you know, to kind of walk backwards, <clears throat> we all know that hey, you buy your loan situation, right? You buy your loan product from your core. This is how this all works. And so it's also where the disasters come in. Uh, and so to set up, let's just say a, a loan core that has all of these different parts and pieces from servicing, origination, compliance, you know, all the parts and pieces. And then you set up a payment side of this thing, which is really interesting to me. And it's all driven through APIs. And so now you got this recent thing with Visa DPS and we're really automating the loan origination process, the payment process, the servicing process. Am I, am I missing all this? Am I kind of understanding it? Yeah, yeah, you've, you've got it. So, um, I I'm sort of a history buff. I love to look at like the cycles and the processes that happen in history. And if you go back, there's there's a bunch of really good books on the material. But um, to oversimplify it, history has this concept of in technology, a series of bundling and then unbundling and then bundling. And it just has this like oscillation process back and forth. And every time that bundle uh, uh, comes apart in an unbundle and then the rebundle, it's shortly, it, it's uh, bundled in a slightly different vertical integration layer. And in some of the most re recent 
uh, incarnations of how the bundling has occurred, what people refer to as the core is really three things, right? It's a deposit core managing a checking and savings account, a CD. It's a wealth management core, and it's a loan core. And as we've got really into the details, um, almost everybody in the industry would refer to the core and they pr primarily mean it as the deposit core. And it's sort of a head scratcher on why are the other two crammed together in that same process. And so what we've done is this approach of everything in the lending core. And so we play nice with the budget deposit course and we integrate and we have solutions and you know this complete solution if it's delivered for a bank or a credit union right typically the relationship account has historically been viewed as the deposit account. Well, we've entered new opportunities where the lending products are turning into the relationship type products. Right. So you, you reference like personalization, a few things that way. So think of us as everything that's necessary for a lending core. And we support flavors of any kind of a loan. And so we really approach this on how can you do that? Well, it goes a little bit back to our Genesis story. Uh, we did auto loans to start out with. Our very first version of the software, we, uh, we, our particular lending company, we did payments on the 1st or the 15th. We thought, you know what, based off your payroll cycle or whatever, we'll put you to that. And so the very, very first customers, we thought, we're just going to be able to convince them that they can change their loan products to have them be due on the 1st or the 15th. Turns out you can't do that. Doesn't work, right? So we had to build out and this like very fast feedback loop of all these different frequencies and and so forth. So that's like the most simplistic, but that same concept. Uh, I like the 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 analogy of a radio station. You're sitting in there and you have all your panels out and all these different levers that go up or down, and the state of where those are those levers are at equals a lending product. And then you just have to like move them up or down and that equals a different lending product. And it turns out if you build it the right way and you, you build out all the, the appropriate levers, you can build a configurable platform that runs the entire gamut of different kinds of lending products. That might be who it's, the regulation is with and the compliance. And let me give one example. The, uh, I, I mentioned this one often, but there's an alphabet of different government regulatory agencies that you're familiar with. And if a customer calls in and they say, hey, Tanner, I had this crazy life story that happened and I want to change my due date. Can I do a, a payment forbearance? Mm -hmm. Tanner's like, well, that kind of sounds like a wild story and I like it. So I'm going to give you points for like at least a good story. If it's true or not, I don't know. But you get points for the, for the good story, right? Is it, is it up to Tanner? Does he get to decide, you seem nice enough, let me do that for you? Well, the answer is it depends, right? right? It depends on who your regulator is. Are you a depository? Well, if you are, there's a, an agency called the FFIEC that has a pretty strong opinion about that, if you can do it or not. And they have this punch list of the hoops you gotta jump through for the account to qualify to do what would be like this loan life cycle process. Well everybody has an opinion if you're if you're not a depository and maybe you're funding those loans with private money you could maybe provide a different answer you can define different hoops to jump through to see if they qualify for that or not so i like the analogy of when i was in elementary school the overhead projector and they would yeah. present up on the slide and then like those those uh, the papers you'd put on to project up I imagine each one of the sheets that you put on for the overhead projection equals one of the government regulations or maybe a partner bank or a capital requirement or credit facility or your own business rules. And you start layering all of these, these sheets for presentation up on the wall and then you just make everybody color within the lines. And so that's what we've built out that supports that. You're, you're gonna die when I do this, but probably seven, eight years ago, I explained for months and months this analogy of basically building data stacking and layering, right, with the overhead projector. Yeah. <laughs> papers, right? And I explained this to dad over and over. And I'm like, do you see if you could look down at all of those stacked on top of each other, it would be a completely different animal, right? Yeah. Once we stacked it all up, right? And it's it's basically taking something from two dimensional to three dimensional. Yep. Right. And that, that's really what you're describing. I love it. I'm a big fan. Nate. You guys I, Real quick, I, I want to ask Nate on the payment side, man. Everything I heard from you is payments, payments, payments. 
So back to dad mentioned D- DPS and what you guys are doing there. Will you break down that a little bit? Cause <laughs> yeah, would, would I'm love interested. To, would love to. So you, so Visa DPS, mo- most people don't realize this is a hidden billion dollar company within Visa. Yep. Okay. So they, they process 190, well, they have 190 million cards on file. Mm-hmm. They do $40 billion in trans or 40 billion transactions a year. And probably own, I, last I looked, it was somewhere between 65 and 70% of the financial services debit card market. All, like all, that, the, um, all that the DMJ will allow them to own. Right. Yeah, it was like un, unbelievable. So what, what they have done, which is really interesting to us, is, and, and very new, within, let, let's call it the last 18 to 24 months, they built their own modern issuing processing stack. Right. So they call it DPS forward. This is using entirely new messaging. So ISO 2022 messaging. And it was just this really interesting thing to Rhett and I have like, wow, okay, that that is a net new API first access point to a network. Right. Yep. So what happens if we took Loan Pro, which is everything that Rhett talked about, everything around the card or around the payment. So the servicing, the collections, can I, can I restructure or modify my loan. Well, Rhett's turned all of those questions into APIs, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you wrap that around what DPS had done, then you, all of a sudden you have this unified mon- modern tech stack for a debit and credit card processing system, right? No, like from the ground up. And that can all be accessed via API. So we connected and brought that natively into Loan Pro, right? And so we we wanted to to basically say, okay, what what if we took that entire legacy stack, turned that on its head, opened it up through APIs? What would that mean for a credit union? What would that mean for a fintech? What does that mean for a regional bank? And it means it means actually a lot of things, right? It means seamless compatibility with all of their so integrations become super simple. That that's probably the easiest way to put it. It also means it's super scalable for debit and credit card processing because now this thing's open architecture and it accelerates everything. So everything becomes faster. Deployment of a card, looking at a card, issuing a card, making a payment on a card, all of that just accelerates at a new speed that has not, not been known, right? Or not been understood today. And then the best part is that it's all secure and compliant sitting in the cloud, right? So you, like Rhett talked about, these layers of compliance that wrap around that, we have the guardrails of not only Visa, but the guardrails that we've put in. And so it o- opened and unlocked this new opportunity for both Visa and us and our customers to rethink how they could own their tech stack um, from the debit and credit card issuing like scenario. So super excited about it. And let me add to that. So a lot of the debit card, because if you think of like back to history, the last 15 years or something, a lot of folks popped up that provided debit card issuance. Um, There's a a variety of names, right? You have like uh, older ones that would be like a TSIS and a FIS and Fiserv and First Data, those those ones over history. Then there was like a new generation of them, like a a core card, an I2C, and then coming on the end of that is like a Marquetta or a Galileo and so forth. So so that journey. But what they have is that next generation of think of like a a Galileo or a, a Marquetta and so forth. They've built out some really cool things from the lens of card. Right. So they built out like the issuing processing, all the services that go around a card. How do you attribute a card? And we've seen innovations be like this card will work at a certain place, but not another place. Or I can stitch multiple cards to the same ledger or they, they so they've done some innovative things. We think we've kind of upped the ante a little bit. Just go ahead and say, well, what if we take a debit card issuer and we provide like the the ability for them to jump over the fence to be a credit card issuer. On a credit card, there's increased basis points that are happening on the interchange. But uh, the difficulty is if you look at it from the lens from the credit, from the card world, they're kind of the same, right? You got to have a card, you got to issue it physical or digital, you have fraud, you have to do message routing to ask, is this approved? You have card attribution, all those things. But the big difference is 
a debit card's going to have open to buy, like is there enough money for this thing to be approved, versus a credit card's going to have just a slightly different term of available credit. But turns out if you go down that available credit rabbit hole, now you have billing cycles and interest accrual and statements and credit reporting and repayment and delinquency and all of the government regulations on loans. Loan. Well, that's yep. exactly what we do. So we do the card as an access point to the line of credit. So take a debit issuer like our friends at Visa, DPS or, or others, and them plus us is a modern alternative to like a Pfizer CCM in a new unified modern stack. Perfect. This is I, so good. Man, I'm going to tell you what, for a loan guy, you know a lot about payments. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure how far we were going to go there for a second, but yeah, was, this is great, man. I, uh, I, I love smart people that understand the depth of our industry. That's what opens up innovation. I also think this is also where our regulators are so far behind trying to catch up and trying to understand. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And so we're going to bring in an expert and the expert they bring in is actually somebody <laughs> not really even understanding what the hell we're doing. It opens up opportunities for bankers. When we talk about me and me and Tanner have had this conversation at midnight so many times. First off, back to the three brothers. I love this so much because man, you talk about some really, take the gloves off kind of talks. You don't have to worry about the politics of the relationship yep. anymore. We've done beat each other up on so many times on other things and learn to respect each other's strengths. Yep. It also allows innovation and depth because you're challenging each other to learn and get smarter on these things. Now for the bank side, we've got core and then we have FinTech. Yep. The layers in between have actually been the problem. Yep. And uh, where we begin to layer things onto the core so back in the old days and beyond, did core and core conversion and all that stuff. Didn't think at the time that I, thought, I literally thought I was wasting my time in life. And it turns out later on that, man, that was seriously valuable. So when yes. you're going and you sell a core and you're doing a core conversion, you've got the deposit products, you've got savings, you know, and, you know, money market. But when you get to the loan, okay, that's where the really smart guys come in because we've got mortgage, we've got auto, all the different loan pieces that have to be done and dealt with differently. If you take a layer on the core, you know, like your Pfizer core or your FIS core, and then you put a layer for the lending side on top of that. And then we're going to take that layer and it put API accessibility points. This is really what we're talking about here, guys. Right. And be able to extend that out and make the payment side of that and offer up credit. Bankers can't offer credit very easily today. And so this is a huge opportunity. And, and bankers also don't really fully follow the concept of a layer on top of core. It's always been an outside force, you know, like a right. mobile that's API and in and all that stuff. So this new idea that you've come up with here and a couple of other people have, you know, working on this in different angles. This is where we believe, you know, when I say we I mean FinTech Cowboys, we're, we're heading strong into this idea that this new layer and accessibility and, you know, when you talk about the, the 22 uh, as opposed to the, you know, 83, 85, yep. that opens up a lot of opportunities there on on the credit and, you know, pay by bank. I mean, not the pay by bank, but the uh, uh, direct pay. Uh, yep. There's, you know, movement of money that can be done in different ways. LOC offering is, a, is a, and, and what you're really talking about, too, is just the ability to initiate a payment. So you've got your document management piece, the compliance piece. All of these things are layered in and can be extended from the bank or brought in from an outside party. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Nate, why don't you briefly talk about some of our personalization we can do be, that's enabled by uh, 20022? Yeah. So there, this is kind of a cool thing, right? Um, and, and one of the, the main reasons I got really excited about yeah. what we were building was this concept of, of owning the core, or let's call it the loan account. Right. Maybe that's a simple way to, to think about it is owning that loan account outside of the traditional or legacy core. And in looking at it from that perspective, what, what could we do as a fintech, right, with all the data that we're going to get? So we're now going to get a whole bunch of new data. We're getting new data from the ISO messaging. And what does that data tell us? What, what you know, how do we think about that from Loan Pro? And, and Rhett just, I mean, had a patented, it's now a bunch of patents around it, but had a patented genius idea of, hey, Nate, 
when you look at a loan account, there is no reason why this transaction data needs to just be lumped into one thing. Like, why can't we have unique transactions with their own financial instrument? Meaning, why can't a swipe from Costco or a swipe from Target be treat treated totally different or uniquely based on the user? Like, what if what if they want their swipe from Starbucks to have a unique interest rate because they love Starbucks? And so they could opt the consumer or the bank that's issuing opts for a 2% APR versus a 25% APR to build loyalty. So those that that's like one concept that we could take. But then you took it a step further and like, well, what else is in that data? Well, there's geo location data. So that means on game day, if there's a card that we could treat restaurants around the stadium in a very unique way. And all purchases inside the stadium, if you swipe, could be treated totally different. That could be statement credits. There's also time data. There's consumer data. Who is this person? There's repayment data on how their behavior is. All of those things can now play into this card to build hyper-personalized credit programs. Well, if you think about credit unions or, or who's been really good at, at personalization, brands and airlines, <laughs> right? Co-brand deals. Well, what if we could take that exact same concept and push that into community, regional, and community banking and, commu and credit union banking in an affordable way so that they could literally stand up a card program in weeks and have control of the system to configure those types of things. Like if I'm on the border and I have a whole bunch of like a, a very unique demographic of people that I know how to service, which credit unions do, credit union for policemen, credit union for firemen, credit union for teachers, all of those have super unique card needs, right? And we've created the way for them to build that program to treat a teacher how they would want to be treated. Meaning, hey, if I'm not te teaching between June and August, maybe my payment schedule, I don't collect Perfect. payments on that. Perfect. Like that kind of stuff. So okay. super excited yeah. about what that means. I've pointed yeah. out before, it, it's like fintechs are the new de novo, and they actually look a lot like credit unions, right? Yeah. Brands yeah. that are built for yeah. their personalized brands, right? So yeah. all over it. I love it. Really well, this is really the thing with the banking community is, is, and why we do all of this is that we want everybody to understand, you know, Tanner has this great line about, you know, escape toward where the puck's going to be. Yep. And if you're not doing that in banking today, you're really missing because there has been a fundamental shift. And right now we've got regulators that are kind of, you know, I don't want to say they're doing a bad job, but they're damn sure doing a PR bad job. They're a little behind. Now, just a little granted, behind. there were some early players in all of this stuff in Bass that really probably should have done things a better way than what they right. did. And, I, and I'm not going to let anybody off the hook. Yes, they knew what they were doing and they did it wrong. And it's going to cost all of us a lot of bullshit. Now, that doesn't change the fact of where the puck is going to be, guys. It's going to be here. And when you see companies like Loan Pro, and what is it? LoanPro.io is your, your website. Check it. Guys, I mean, just the website alone is awesome. <laughs> but check everything out of what we're talking about here and understand whether it's a layer on top of core. It's, it's, this is inside your bank. This is not some outside party that we're talking about here. They're using better technology to allow you to be able to serve your business customers and your consumers or create completely different brands off your bank than what you've ever been able to do in the past. And what we're this is the coolest part for me, guys. You know what the barrier is? Your imagination. Right. And holy cow, man. I think what he's really business. getting at that I really like with you guys. And I've, I've thought this way for years. It's difficult to put into words. But in short, bankers really buy features. Like we could call them products, but they're really like use cases or a day in the life like features. Rather than what we all think about as platforms or things that are able to be malleable and change. And that's really what you guys are describing is I loved when you hit on data attributes. It's like, oh man, my wheels are spinning too, right? I love it. There's there's a thousand possible products or features to be built, maybe a million to be built. Right off of the concept, right? And so I love the conceptual platform theme. It It's all kinds of opportunities in the future. And I think that the lack of that thinking is what has put a lot of bankers and credit unions and frankly, fintechs stuck into the boxes that they're stuck in, right? Is products that aren't able to change. Ed, you, one of my favorite quotes, hopefully I'll get it right. It's from Einstein. 
and it says imagination is everything it's the preview of life's comings attractions like what are it so that this idea that stuff just doesn't magically create itself right if you have to imagine it and then you sort of have this responsibility to have that turn into reality to create life's coming attractions and i think there's just a massive opportunity in uh, in banking in particular think of the impact uh, we started out a little bit of the conversation on at uh, everyday families and the impact that money has right money is like a universal sort of uh, doesn't really matter where you're at it, it impacts your life and it disproportionately impacts your life when you're lower when you have less dollars and uh, the imagination concept there's been a lot of things that people have done right they've tried to increase uh, access to capital and do it in ways that doesn't increase the risk or the portfolio performance by using we'll call them unique data sets for underwriting well that's been a regulatory nightmare to try to figure out how to do that the right way so like how do we proceed with those things well one of the pieces is designing the financial instrument for the act for the borrower instead of today financial instruments by and large are designed for the capital for the money that was invested in to give the loan so you think of for example nate's example of giving a loan let's let's not even do cards let's do like installment loan to a teacher that some of the school districts in the united states have diminished or no pay during the summer well if you give a loan to a teacher that's a straight line amortized loan and then they have a little difficulty making a payment in the summer. Come on, you knew that. Like, like you you underwrote that risk model in your underwriting procedure. Well, it turns out we have uh, several that we've published uh, some um, papers on. When you design a financial product for the cohort that you're targeting, it's more performant. You make more money and your customers are happy. You have a higher customer delight uh, uh, reports and NPS scores. You have higher repayment. And some of the challenges, specifically because we focus on the technology for servicing and collections and you know operating and managing the loan, but there's been the uh, uh, this industry acceptance of something that's not true. There's been this concept that delinquency is the proxy to know of performance on loans. It turns out people are using delinquency wrong. They're using delinquency instead of engagement. If uh, about this report came out from about four years ago, if you call a servicing company in the United States as of the report four years ago, before you're delinquent, you call your lender and you say, whatever happened in my life, I'm really nervous. I can't make this next payment. Can I work with you? 70% of them have the answer of call me back when you have missed your payment. Well, what, what happens emotionally for the person who calls you in? They say, oh, crap, these guys aren't going to help me. Right. They, right. Start, they start figuring something else out. If it's the car they called in, they try to figure out, okay, how am I going to not need that car? I start figuring out my waterfall of what's the next most important bill to pay. It's like a, a psychological and subconscious thing that all of us would do because you're trying to figure out. But instead, if the response was like, hey, let's, let's proactively service and manage these loans. Let's not reactively service and manage them. Proactive servicing and management is much more performant on the portfolio. And then you have the right customers. You don't have to pay to acquire a customer again because you have loyalty in your customer. So this idea of instead of like reward points and loyalty, let's pull that forward into the financial instrument and the policies and procedures and behavior of how the financial instrument and how you engage. And that creates uh, better touch points and engagement, which creates much more performant portfolios. I Beautiful. love you guys yeah. think. I got to chime in here real quick. So, I'm you, so glad we got that on video, man. That was great. You, you think, <laughs> about, ahead, think, think about the job of the future, right? If we, if we do loans, how we've been doing loans for the last hundred years, they all, they all got paid every two weeks. Right? <laughs> the way that people are getting paid today is like for the job they do. They go and do the job. I dropped off something, I picked someone up, or I published something online, right? So this has to, this creates 
the behavior or the opportunity to have a totally different loan type, right? Yes, again, I'm brilliant. Gonna meet, Just I'm going to meet my customer where I'm at because they get paid differently, right? And we see it, okay, teachers were there, like firemen or their athletes. We do some crazy athlete loans because <laughs> they get paid once a year in their licensing agreement and they can loan against that licensing agreement, but you can't charge interest because there's certain things that, that have to happen on that, that licensing agreement performance from the athlete. And so you don't really know how much you're going to get paid on the scale. Like when we look at the contract, that, that those were early loans that we were doing in our history, which, hey, happens now that everybody's being paid weird, right? And they're going to continue to get paid different than how they've been paid in the past. And we got we to gotta, like, hit that and be able to, to help our customers, whether that's the financial institution or fintech, you know, be able to meet that. The other, yeah. the other thing, I was just like scrolling my feed uh, this morning on LinkedIn, and I can't believe the amount of my friends hardcore bankers going to fintechs like the fintechs hiring them to get bank expertise and then yes. the other way all the banks hiring my fintech friends to like come in and, and help like there is this like mass migration both ways right now yep. um and it, it's like finally you know we're, we're kind of kind of like semi back okay like looks like we're gonna work together here like this this is Nate, you know it's so good this is why i pound this to people guys this is the beginning we're not at the end of anything. We're at the very beginning of something. And I love what you said because, hey, how many bankers out there actually, you know, what we're talking about is what we call earned wage, right? You work for Uber and you work for two hours and you get paid right. for two hours. Yeah. That I mean, that day. All right. How many people offer that? Much less the opportunity to say, I'd like to take those two hours and apply it to a loan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You don't have any of the real life things that people are going through every day. And this technology on our phone, or these new opportunities that FinTech have presented in the marketplace, they've fundamentally changed people's behavior and we have to catch up. And if you're sitting around, and I mean, not to pick, I hate, I don't even like the word legacy course, but when people sit around and say, okay, I'm waiting on this package or this bundle to come from there. What is your real touch point? It's your right. mobile banking app, which is basically reinvention of online banking on your yep. phone, it sucks. <laughs> it's not even close to what it. people are experiencing, you know. And I mean, if I could put a little clip from, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the social media, you know, gifts out there or something, right, or a meme inside of my payment part or whatever. Okay, we have got to integrate real life of real people, yeah. whether that's yeah. earned wage payments, yeah. all of the things that we're talking about in a new and different way. Well, and you can't layer that into what you have right now, except one feature at a time. And then you couldn't expose it to your users if you wanted to without that, affecting your mobile app. Okay. Now we've opened up the door to what can be and what we it's literally back to what's your imagination? What do you want to think? You know, that you guys, I mean, just some of the things Nate just said was absolutely brilliant. Uh, the idea of thinking more like the customer and building the product around what they want. That was great, Brett. Yeah. So, so a couple of things. So I, I really like today, I kind of heard both sides. I love the origin story and where everything came from, but I heard the different way of thinking about, let's just call it product architecture, right? Sure. And more in a three-dimensional way. And then actually a three-dimensional view using attributes of a customer to right. build what they need, right? So look, I love today's conversation. This was so cool. And I thought you guys were really 360 and dynamic and how you talked about it. But I want to give both you guys a minute or two final thoughts, anything at all that's on your mind. Go ahead, Nate. You want me to go? So, yeah, yeah. so Dave, you, you had two two things that, well, one, maybe two things. Number one, you brought up this, like, the war for the customers just beginning, right? We, we are going to look back 10 years from now, even probably five years from now, and we'll look at what's happening right now, this migration of customers to fintechs or vice versa as like a backyard tussle on the trampoline, right? It's going to be like nothing, right? It's not like countries are waging war against each other, but it it is just beginning. And, and owning that customer experience is, is so, so critical. So my, I mean, my closing thought is I really like think through this. It is, I, I want our customers and I think all everyone at Loan Pro wants our customers to get control of their tech stock 
tech stack back, right? Why do we want them to control this tech stack? Like we, we need them to own that customer. That's how they're going to win the customers. When they own that tech stack, they can do the things and use their imagination to say, hey, I can configure and build the stuff my customers need. The other reason why we want them to own it is because they can control their operational efficiency, right? I mean, th this is so important for the banks and what they're, especially community banks and what they're facing today. Like, I, I think the, I, I don't, I can't remember what the term is. And it's like the Toyota processing term. I think they call it Jidoka or something like that, but they call it, it was this like, they, they call it like auto nomination, which is basically like the concept of building quality into their systems or designing their system, designing their tech to detect abnormalities and then let those things self-correct. Their systems can correct themselves. Like that's what we've designed, right? We've designed a system where you can really own that stack, improve your operational efficiency, but ensure that it's like correcting itself with everything that's changing. Right. And then you can have a healthy business, like your model can work. So I'd leave that with our customers, you know, like own that stack and, and use it for operational efficiency. Perfect. My, my, my comments are, um, I'm going to go a little bit higher level about culture. So um, that's it's not something that happens by itself, but being very intentional as you build a business, as you're building a bank, as you're building a product, to design it intentionally. So Loan Pro, we have <clears throat> three commitments. Our first is customer delight. Second is our own team members becoming journey. This process in life, we're trying to become our best selves. How do we become and how do we provide a process, a company, a, a, a workflow, everything that helps all of us in our own becoming journey? And third is sustainable growth. Our, our customers are financial institutions, and they, many of them are often quite a risk adverse. They're looking for a modernization journey. They're looking for what we you know, lead with compliance, optimization, modernization, personalization, if you will. The, this concept where, yes, they want to do, as Tanner said, features, but you got to start with a culture, right? What are you trying to build? What's the problem? McKinsey's first law, first understand your problem. And I think often too many people jump to solutioning a solution instead of, I mean, like think of online banking. The whole reason it exists is because a feature was missing from the core, yeah. right? Like, like, you know, so like, I think you're solutioning a solution instead of first solutioning a deep understanding of the problem. And uh, this is not something that's solved overnight. We've been at it for approaching 20 years. That creates a reasonable moat in the process and the journey. Um, the second is the innovation is coming with or without us, but there's a book written by uh, uh, D. Hawk, founder of Visa, called One From Many, one of my favorite books. And he has this concept of in life, we spend so much time uh, focused on what was and what is, we spend a little bit of time on what might be, but unfortunately, where we should spend most of our time, but unfortunately most don't, is designing what ought to be. And so the, the, uh, as everybody listens to this and, and maybe watches this, uh, this uh, time we've had together, my encouragement would be how ought it to be and then work backwards to reality. Like, let's design for how it ought to be. If that's the reg regulatory framework, if that's a product, if that's how the financial instrument should work, then let's work back and then insert all of the reality that, okay, I can't do it how it ought to be because of these reasons, but then I know my delta. I know the difference and the reason why I'm not doing it how it ought to be so that as those levers change and adjust, I can pivot and get more close to how it ought to be. And that's software development, that's financial products, that's that's being a good person too, by the way. Like it's just the principles of how you you approach things. And so uh, I hit it from a little bit of a higher level because uh, in my role, it's really important to set the tone. It's really important to set the direction that we're going after. And uh, as you invent and build new things, that this is coming, this is happening. If we just wait for someone else to do it, then it will be their imagination that creates the future. If nice. we jump in and do it, then we get to help create the future literally together. And that, that's one of the most fulfilling and exciting things there is. You saw it just at the Visa announcement, um, this flex credential, 
right? Yes. This idea. I'm raving about right? it. It's no just one else what's going on. It's I huge. So that's a like so think of the seat that I sit in with the flex credential right the flex credential as they announced it is going to be like a decisioning thing uh, you can think of a decision tree and which way to push it does this go to an installment loan based off of attribution of the transaction saved at the, the transaction but so uh, essentially or saved at the card level so essentially it's a nested level of tokens so you got a master token, nest another level of tokens, and then you do like, I don't know, uh, switch this way, this way, this way, right? And based off attribution. Well, we can introduce something significantly more powerful if you're controlling the ledger. Because now you can, instead of doing the, uh, the gating or the routing at the credential level, you can actually receive it and do it at the ledger level. And so you can say both, uh, both in auth, I can route based, you know, if it's Starbucks or a dollar amount or whatever, but I can use things about your loan. So how about not just Starbucks goes to my debit card and transactions over thousand dollars goes to my credit card, but how about if I'm current on my credit card, then it does this, or what's my balance of my, my checking account or stuff you can get out of your ledger. So like this innovation is happening and we want to help create the future. It's a big deal. I, I really think that that announcement that for some reason, everybody, I don't know why every article for the last month hasn't been about this. I this know. is even talking about, if you'd said digital ID, everybody would have freaked out. Right. right. I mean, that's right. Exactly. And I think this is the precursor to the big banks and digital wallets. I don't know exactly where that shakes out, but it gets really interesting for me to watch where all that comes out. It's the future that we've all thought about and been promising for 10 years <laughs> is now actually able to be built. Yep. I mean, finally, it's a big deal. So. And they've got some really smart people. We, we know the team there at Visa. They're doing some really cool things. And uh, like like uh, Dave said, this is just the beginning. There's going to be some really cool stuff. You saw their additional announcements to support the process of like peer-to-peer -peer payments. They're, yep. they're positioned very well with the network. But people think peer-to-peer -peer payments are easy. Well, yeah, it's easy to move the money, but it's super hard to deal with like your fraud or get your money back if something went wrong or is it a legit transaction or all the stuff that's in the middle that the networks have become really good at. So they're being really smart on how they do that and uh, it will be really helpful to influence and to, to, to create that going forward. I, well, I most, know importantly, most importantly right here, guys, this is where you get your ass kicked. This is where the big banks are going to go, got it. And they roll yep. miles an hour into a world you didn't even see coming. Yep. And you are completely unprepared. And that's why you guys have stepped in and said, hey, we can show you how to do it too. That's right. Yes. Hats off to you guys for it. And I can say seriously, confidently, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody hang on the lending or the payments discussion as well as you guys did both. <laughs> Yeah, that was no kidding, man. Yeah, I'm serious. You guys are rock stars. Well, it, it, it's you. important to it's super important to eat your own cooking, right? We were the lender, so we <laughs> know exactly what you need um, in our card space. We've launched our own internal Loan Pro card, consumed by our own team and stuff. So when we go buy stuff, we use our Loan Pro card because you got to eat your own cooking, right? It's not just I abstractly created this thing. Good, good luck. Go use it. We, it's a super important to have a deep domain yeah. expertise. How, yeah. how amazing is it that we have a new payment rail, right? right? Like, just think about that. Like, that's just like a moment of silence worthy yeah. thing of like, hey, it's been since 1972 when they created ACA. We actually have a new <laughs> payment rail. Like what, that's, the timing of that, Yep. right? And what we're doing, it's just like, it's just, just is we live in such an awesome time, Dave. I was, or I, I remember Dave, Dave or Chan. Oh yeah, Dave, you're talking about the core migration. I remember when I got assigned to payments, I was so mad, right? Like 17 years ago, I was just like irate, like oh my gosh, like I get to do payments. So grateful, <laughs> so grateful for what that yes. was. Now it's just like anyway, yeah. you, it's been so awesome. Like man, so I tell you what, guys, when we get off this thing. Let's call each other, hook up so we can hang out yeah. together and have some fun. That'd it. be great. <laughs> awesome. Hey, guys, thank you all again for joining us. This was so cool. Looking forward to doing more, man. Catch you guys next time. Hey, thank awesome. you. Appreciate it. We'll see you later. later.